Um, and meanwhile, we just talked about this on yesterday's show, and we'll kick off with it today. The links that Gareth Southgate could be the next Manchester United manager. This is a story that won't go away. And this is a man, of course, when you take a look at his domestic record, it's not something that screams big-time manager for the sort of aspirations that Manchester United have. Of course, he's done exceptionally well with England, but got relegated uh, with Borough back in the day. Let's go to the man who broke this story. Mark Ogden is with us uh, alongside uh, Frank LeBeouf. Oggy, why? Well, I suppose there's, there's three managers that Man United would desperately love to have. Jurgen Klopp, Pep Guardiola and Carlo Ancelotti. And they can't get any of them, <laughs> let's be honest. They, they, they are completely out of reach. So beyond that, the list, the list of candidates is there's no ideal outstanding candidate. You know, that Roberto De Zerbi is a guy that they would look at, but, you know, he's had a few issues at Brighton recently. He's, he's, he's challenging the owner. I hear that he really fancies the Liverpool job. You've got Julian Nagelsmann, didn't do so well at Bayern Munich. You've got Thomas Tuchel, a bit too abrasive for the owner. So when you go through every candidate that's out there, they've all got flaws. Now, Gareth Southgate also has his flaws. You know, he's a, he's a guy that you'd, you'd say is maybe too cautious, too negative at the very sharp end of a tournament. Is he the guy that's going to win you a Champions League or a Premier League? Who knows? But he's very close to Dan Ashworth, who's going to be the director of football at United next season. He's got a long-standing relationship with Dave Brailsford, who is basically Jim Radcliffe's man at Man United who's running everything at Old Trafford. And they want somebody they know they can trust who can get the job done in terms of make United function properly again. He's got a good record of, of developing a, a harmonious squad, as we've seen with England. Because the one thing in, in Southgate's credit is when he took that England job, it was a mess. England was an absolute mess in, in the sense that nobody wanted to kind of back the team, nobody wanted to watch the team, that a lot of the players weren't interested in being around the squad. But he changed all that, got into a World Cup semi-final, a Euros final, Yes, he's fallen short. When I did this story maybe last month, the, the reaction from United fans was so negative. It was like Rafa Benitez going to Everton. It was one of these stories that you just think, it's just never going to fly. But Sir Jim Radcliffe, Dave, Dave Brailsford, they've got, they're very set in the ways, they know what they want. And for them, Gareth Southgate is a guy that ticks a lot of the boxes. No manager out there ticks all the boxes. No manager that can get ticks all the boxes. Gareth Southgate is a guy that they think that can take United where they want to go. I'm yet to be convinced, but that's the logic that I've been told that they, they see. Who would you choose, Craig? Ten Hag or Southgate? <sighs> oh. So, dancing with the devil there, aren't you, really? I mean, look, I think Southgate's a difficult sell to, to a club, Man United size. And we can't deny the, the job he's done with England thus far, and we can go back to Augie's point and debate whether he's been a little bit overcautious at times, and we can go back to the Croatia semi-final where they were getting overrun in the midfield. He did nothing about it. So there are, there are negatives out there, but there are positives. One of the things with international football is you're dealt a, a, you're, you're dealt a, a hand, right? You can't really change it too much. Mm -hmm. And there has been an, element, has been an element of good timing, I think, as well, because some of the older guard were going... Then you've had the likes of Bakaya Saka coming through, Phil Foden coming through, Declan Rice coming through. And we were talking about guys who would be either on the, the world stage or close to being world class. Uh, and I think that has helped the scenario. Now, where he's done well, he's managed to get the Harry Maguires and others, he's managed to get performances out of them. But in terms of going in to manage a football club that size with a... 25, 30-man playing squad to have to deal with recruitment. There's nothing in his CV that suggests... I could see him popping back out of the England job into mid-table Premier League. Don't, you know, I've, I wouldn't have a massive issue with that. But we're, we're talking about a club here that when you're spending one and a quarter billion to invest into the club and you're not even buying the club for that, you want to, surely you want to be up there with the elite teams, and I don't think Gareth Southgate takes them there. So the answer to my question is Ten Hag? The answer is uh, neither. Well, that wasn't an option. <laughs> That's to be one or the other. There's a ghost manager in yeah. there. Oh, really? What's his name? Casper? <laughs> uh, Shank? Um, <laughs> to, well, if you're asking me the same question, I'd, I'd take my chance with Gareth Southgate. Would you? I don't think Eric Ten Hag has done an awful lot. He's, he's, just, he's just orchestrated one of the greatest FA Cup victories ever. OK, one, one swallow doesn't make a summer. I, I think unless Manchester United are able to build on that and, and show that they're...
they truly are progressing, not what Ten Hag has, has been trying to sell us on, on, on progress. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I continue. And while I, I understand the, the concern around around Gareth Southgate, I think it's a little unfair to, to draw the Middlesbrough. That was 15 years ago, and international football, just by by its nature, is, is a lot different from 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 club football. Um, though I, I admit, I, I do understand the concern. But if I had to choose one of the two this summer, I, and and every and the rest of the season plays out as we've kind of seen the last couple of months. And uh, I, I would go second Gareth Southgate. Mark, how much has the result at the weekend changed the narrative, if at all, around Ten Hag? Well, it's changed the narrative, I guess, amongst the supporters and, and amongst those guys that are talking about it. But he's not convinced the people that are going to run the club. And every new, every club that has a new owner, pretty much within six months, they change the manager. It's, it's just what happens. It's just, mm. you know, they find somebody that, that fits their, their remit and they go with that. And I think another significant point as well with Southgate is that Eric Tanag is going to cost between maybe 10 and 14 million pounds to, to, to pay off in terms of compensation, his coaches, you know, his backroom staff. Gareth Southgate will have no compensation because he's got he's got basically four months left of his FA contract once the, the Euro's finished. Now, that matters to Man United because at the moment they've got issues with FFP, with the, uh, the new financial rules. And, you know, every million pound counts. And if they can save 10, 14, 15 million pounds that it would cost to get another coach, then that is a good deal. But equally, you can't really make an appointment of a, a manager for your club based on a position of weakness. And that position of weakness is the financial situation. But, you know, Eric Ten Hag has had a really, really bad season. The Liverpool game was, was just a kind of an outlier in terms of what, what, what he's done. So I don't think you can base his future on what happened in quite a lucky win against Liverpool. Oh. Take Posh to Coglo over both of them. I don't, I don't understand why he's not in the, the talk for these things more. Is it because he... He managed in Australia? Is it because he managed in Japan? Is it because he managed in Scotland? Where are oh, he can just turn up and win? And yeah, it's not a good week to be talking about him, I suppose, because they got walloped by Fulham. And Villa have had a downturn as well with a very good manager and Unai Emery. But I'd have Posta Coglu over either of those two. Right. 100%. Is, is he a ghost manager? Is Posta Coglu a ghost? He's well, quite a big ghost. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to miss, isn't he? You know, I, I agree with the Deserbi. Roberto De Zerbi at the moment has to find his mojo again. Yeah. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, and I do think there are other managers out there, but, you know, if you're saying to me Southgate or Postacoglu, I'm taking Postacoglu. I'm, I'm, in fact, you're, you're not getting Zinedine Zidane, so you might as well scrub him off that list, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Ruben Amarim. Amarim. He's done a good, He's been talked with a lot of clubs recently. <laughs> yes. Sporting uh, yeah. coach, young youngish guy, but I'm still taking the Tottenham manager over most of them, so, uh, and I, I really am. But then obviously you got the situation, I suppose, Mark, with compensation. You could throw Unai Emery in that conversation as well. But surely Manchester United, the club of the financial standing that they have, they could go in there and they could go big on a manager like that. Well, they can't because th these new rules that we haven't got long enough to kind of get into the intricacies of what makes them complicated. But even clubs like Man United, like Arsenal, they're struggling to comply with FFP and PSR this summer because of their spend in the last 18 months, two years. So United are really kind of up against it. They've got a ground to pay for, either to rebuild or to build a new one. They've got a massive debt, which they confirmed last week, of £773 million, which has to be serviced every year. So United have got a lot of financial restrictions, a lot of problems at the moment financially. So... They can't just throw money around on, on compensation for coaches, especially if they're paying one up to go. Can they afford to pay the same sort of money to an Ange Postacoglu, who, you know, is a name that I've heard on the fringes, but not really a serious name. And I, I suppose it's because maybe they don't think they can get him out of Tottenham. It's the, it's, it's the old Daniel Levy thing again, isn't it? You know, how much would it cost to get Postacoglu out of Tottenham? Quite a lot of money. So they have to do things sensibly. And they, they've said right from the outset that they... They spent about six months doing an audit of Man United's recent recruitment, how much they've wasted on players. The, the last thing they want to do, having done that, is, is make their first big decision to throw loads of money away again on compensation because it's just a waste of money. So United have to find a way to to, to bridge that gap. And, and if they think that's Gareth Southgate, you know, it's a bold choice. It would be an interesting move and I think they'd have a, a PR battle to win. But, you know, one thing is we have to think with Southgate. If... If the likes of Harry Kane and even G. Bellingham two or three years down the line want to come back to England, then Gareth Southgate as your manager gives United a really good chance to get those players, certainly Harry Kane. So maybe that's part of the thinking that 
he's got a great you know rapport with the England squad. He might get more at Rashford. He might get more at Maguire. Save United the fortune on a new centre half. So there are lots of elements of this that it does make sense. But overall, to manage Man United, I think you need to be a big personality. You need to be a guy that can walk in that stadium like Eric Cantona did, like Alex Ferguson did, and think, well, you know, this is this is my scene, this is my stage. And I'm not quite sure that's Gareth Southgate, but I don't see any of the candidates out there that would do that anyway. I think, he, you know, you have to find a, a candidate that ticks as many boxes as possible because nobody ticks all the boxes. Uh, of course, the weekend very much a highlight for Manchester United. Unfortunately, for fans of the club, there's been plenty of lowlights as well. Bruno Fernandes uh, has been struggling so far this season, and we talked about... Uh, those struggles yesterday. In the interview, he was also asked about the intensity that he shows on the pitch. Of course, a lot of arm waving. Uh, and some people, including like Sir Roy Keane, question whether or not he should be the captain of Manchester United. Uh, on being demanding and intense, it says uh, this often conveys the image of bad temper because it comes from the way we experience the game, from how we are so intense. And intense players are difficult to understand. There's a lot of intense there, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that the guys will know. It, what it boils down to is he's frustrated by the players around him that a lot of them aren't good enough, and he's frustrated that they're not playing to the level that he wants. He's frustrated at referees' decisions. He, he's taking his frustrations out on on everybody, referees, you know, opponents. But I just think it boils down to the fact that he's not content with the players that are, the majority of the players that are around him. Frankie's one of your favourite players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I've been quite critical about uh, Bruno Fernandes. I recognise his talent. And, <clears throat> and I want to explain so that people from south of Europe, and I'm one of them, I was born in Marseille, you know, when we talk like Italian, we talk with the hands, with the hands, sorry, and, uh, and we express everything with our body. So he's kind of a player like that when he wants to show uh, uh, a frustration, for example. He has to do it and show it with his hands. And uh, it's not because he's becoming, you know... Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, worse than the, 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 than we think. He's just expressing him, uh, himself. So I, I think he should calm down. Manchester United have just come off one of the biggest wins they've had for I don't know how long against a fantastic team. One of the best quarterfinals that we have seen in many a year. Went all the way, almost to penalties. It was end to end, and and you know, I think there's a time and a place. And I don't think it's now. You know, we know he's a frustrating player. We know he's not having the best of seasons. And we know he can get a bit indisciplined in his game. But he played his part. I mean, he worked hard and he didn't... Blah, blah, blah. And, I just, and for me, I just, I just... What I don't understand is why we're picking the bones out of a player in a week where his club have just had the biggest result that they could ever have had imagined, bearing in mind their circumstances. I suppose because he's, he's addressed this in the interview. What it, interview? It's put, put, the interview that he's given, and he's talking about this. No, I don't, he's talking about the intensity. Any interviews. No, but that, that's why it's not as if we've suddenly gone out of the air and gone, oh, let's talk about Bruno Fernandes today. It's reacting to the interview that, that he's given. But obviously, this is a man, as you say, who was playing on one leg for the last 30 minutes and extra time. And I think, obviously, but, you know, when the, a lot of fans are doing It's that. all very moot. And, and, and when, when, a, when a team is winning, all these things are, are basically a moot point because at the end of the day, everything gets brushed over when you're getting results. But what about the summer and the swallow? Well, what about it? <laughs> <laughs> what about that? Listen, listen I, I, I understand what, exactly what Craig's saying, but then to, to Bruno Fernandes and doing this interview, it's a good time for him to do the interview because of that game. Um, so he comes out and kind of opens up these, these discussion points. I, I, for one, I don't think Bruno Fernandes is, is that good a captain. And, and um, to the criticism from players like Roy Keane, who was every bit as animated, who shouted at his teammates every bit as much as Bruno Fernandes did. And, and to Mark's point, uh, Roy Keane had far better players around him. Um, I'm not sure that's much of an excuse for, for, for Bruno Fernandes in, in this instance, because while we're talking about a lesser player, a lesser Manchester United, I'm not sure that Bruno Fernandes gets into one of, one of the Premier League's big boys. I'm not sure that he gets into City's starting eleven or Liverpool's, or Arsenal's. So maybe... That's just the level that, that he, is, he is right now. That's the level that where Manchester United are. Um, I, I just feel that, that while he's, he's animated, while he's critical, he doesn't pull the team together in the way that Roy Keane did, or certainly seemed to do. Um, and, and that, for me, will be, will be my complaint. I, no, I have no issue with the remonstrations. I, I just don't feel that the team kind of rallies around him um, in, in the way that 
previous Manchester United manager. Well, he's not a captain. Team. He's not. Look, this is a, this is a different 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 sort of discussion and debate. He's, he's not a captain. Certainly not of Man United. He's not a leader, and that's not the player he is. Uh, but in terms of having a go at other players or or throwing your arms around, show me show me players that 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 don't get animated, and I'll show you players that don't care. Um, we will wrap up Manchester United second by asking where you are, Mark. What are you doing? I'm in Budapest, so it's obviously as we know it's the uh, the playoffs this week for the Euros, so there's, and uh, three teams are going to qualify next week. So I'm doing the the Israel against Iceland game because obviously it's a bigger picture with this one. Israel may qualify for the Euros, so it's a you know it's a story that obviously will catch people's attention. So I'm watching the Israel Iceland game and seeing if they can get to a, a final next week against Ukraine or Bosnia. Oh, my oh, God, that'll go. drive the FC.com absolutely uh, through the building, uh, once. That's it. it. Thank this you very much, Mark. Much appreciated. Just